Uh, we'll talk during the program. I'll give you the whole background about my Newark and New Jersey connection. Okay, well, I was born in Brussels, Belgium. I lived in Brooklyn, New York, most of my life. Uh, my father used to be a furrier. He was a freelance worker, and he used to commute from Brooklyn to Newark to Bamberger's and deliver the, the finished products. Uh, Ming Stoll's, of all things. And he would schlep on the H&M, on the, what is now the PATH trains, and it took him two hours each way. And it was a living. This was in the 50s and 60s, way back. And that's my connect. But I'm also um, very interested in Jewish history. If you go to my website after the program, you can see all the different books I've written. And I give tours of Jewish Newark and uh, Jewish Philadelphia and Jewish New York City. And, you know, just go through it at your leisure. So shall we begin the program? I can put, push the play button on my... Uh, on my, what do you call it? On my Zoom, yeah. now we can see the images, okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Am I on? Can you see? No. No, you know, you're... I think oh. you have to share your screen. Yes. I did share my, okay, I'm gonna have to go through the whole thing, one minute. It'll take a couple of minutes. I have to follow all the way to the end of the program. Give it a minute or two, one second. We're almost there. Hang in there. Coming to the end of the program. There we go. Okay. Now, um, I have the share screen. It's green. Okay. Oh, I say share up here, maybe. Okay. Share. Free iPad. Um, what do we have to do on the bottom here? It says the video is on. The mute is. Can you hear me still? Yes. Okay, I have the green share screen on the bottom of my image here. I, it's green, so that means mm -hmm. you should see things, yes? No, you have to click on that. Okay. And then uh, got it, it will show a screen and then uh, you probably Okay, also... it's got like five different images. Mm -hmm. Desktop or Keynote? Or maybe Keynote if that's the one you want. Yeah. Um, you also have to click on share sound. That's, it's getting there. Um, well, you hear me, yes? Correct. Okay. So I'm going to try it again now. So I'll hit the play. Also make sure share sound is clicked. Um, I don't that's, know where that is. On the, that's I have the images on the side of a whole list of, a whole right. view of, of people on my right I've side. I've got the image on my screen now. Okay, yeah, there's an image click, there. I'm going to click the, uh, the play button. And hopefully, oh, I have to go back to the beginning one second. Mm -hmm. uh, da, 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 there we go. Oh, sorry, hold on. It doesn't go that quickly. <clears throat> okay, there we go. Here we go. We're going to try again. Can you see? Go. Yes. Jewish New Jersey and Vintage Photographs by Oscar Israelowitz. This is the book uh, upon which this lecture, this Zoom program is based. Uh, I wrote this book about 15 years ago, and basically we're going to be going to uh, the urban centers in the beginnings. We're gonna to go to Newark, uh, Trenton, Patterson, Jersey City, Hoboken, um, and a few others. And then we're going to go to the Jewish farming communities of Vineland, Wood, Woodbine, Roosevelt, or the Jersey Homestead, and a few other places. And then we're going to end up with the um, resort communities of Lakewood and the Jersey Shore. So let's begin the program. In the beginnings, the first Jews of Newark were located 
in the Central Ward. Uh, they came in the 1840s. They were mostly German Jews. And I, I don't have a pointer. So you can see it basically in the dead center of uh, this map. It shows on the lower left, uh, the lower right hand corner, the uh, population amounts. The Italians, there were about 50,000. Jews were 50,000. Germans, 40,000. Irish, 30,000, et cetera, et cetera. And some of the noted um, people, German Jews who lived in the city included Louis Plaut, who built the millinery, the beehive, the largest fancy dry goods store in, the, well, he says in the, in the city. Uh, he was located at 707 to 721 Broad Street in Newark. And here we see that view around 1900 with the trolleys going by. He basically started off with the corner house on the right-hand side. It was a three-story building, and then he expanded. He bought four additional buildings, and ultimately he made the Plout department store. Uh, that building is still around. Um, the, the, if you go to Newark these days at your own risk, uh, you will find a city bank at the basement. Here we see Bambergers, which was founded by uh, Louis Bamberger. Um, wonderful person. He lived to be about 91 years old, never got married, uh, but he was a major philanthropist. Uh, he found he was one of the founders of Beth Israel Newark, uh, or Newark Beth Israel Hospital. He also founded the YMHA of Newark and the uh, Newark Public Library and the Newark Museum. Uh, he was he gave back to the community, and here we see a view of Bamberger's department store, one of the major department stores in the United States. Uh, he sold it in 1929, just before the Great Depression, to Macy's, uh, and it was Macy's department store up until the I guess 1990s or so. Um, then the building was abandoned for several several years. It is now still in use. Uh, they have high tech um, computer laboratories and companies in the building. So it's an ongoing uh, institution. Uh, I just want to read a few items that went on in, the, um, in this building. Um, he had, uh, let's see, what did he have here? My goodness. He had a consulting dressmaker, cutting and fitting service, bridal advisor, clothing advisory service, interior decorating, film rental library, fishing and hunting licenses, the United States Post Office on the premises, the Newark Public, Newark, Newark Public Library branch, and there was a fur and drapery storage, and even glove cleaning if you had your silk gloves to be cleaned. Um, aside from all the uh, perfumes and uh, other items of interest, he also had a bookstore. Uh, it was a major, major department store. Continuing. Uh, we're going to see some of the early synagogues, uh, major synagogues in Newark. This was B'nai Jeshurun, which is low. The building was founded uh, in 1848. It is the second oldest uh, Jewish congregation in the state. Uh, its first location was at 224 Washington Street and then at 324 Washington Street. Then they moved to uh, 785 High Street which is, I think, now called Martin Luther King Boulevard. If you look for High Street on a Google map, you will not find it. It doesn't exist. It'd have Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, and then you'll find it. Uh, the congregation is still around. They're now in Short Hills. B'nai Abraham has an interesting beginning. It was founded in 1853 by a small group of Eastern European Polish Jews. Uh, they met in a small room in the home of Abraham Newman, who was one of the founders of B'nai Jeshurun. Uh, he had pity on them since they found that the German ritual uh, during services was not to their likings. So he let them use one of his rooms in his private home. And in honor of that, the small congregation called, its con it called itself B'nai Abraham in honor of B'nai Abraham, the sons of Abraham. Uh, B'nai Abraham moved to Clinton Hill in a very beautiful, majestic building. It's a circular design. Um, this is now on, um, what street was that on again? 
well, Clinton, Clinton Hill, it was on Clinton Avenue, uh, built in 1924. The building is still standing, it's used by a local church. And as you can see, they tried to erase the B'nai Abraham, all they left was the temple. And you can barely make out the B'nai Abraham to the right. Uh, one of the uh, leading uh, rabbis of the congregation was uh, Rabbi Silberfarb, who was there from 1902 to 1937. The third major congregation in Newark was Ohab Shalom. It was organized in 1860. They built their Prince Street Synagogue, which we see here um, in um, 1884. That building later became the Metropolitan Baptist Church and is now home to the Greater Newark Conservancy. Uh, so the building is still standing. Now, Prince Street was the major Jewish uh, center of uh, Newark. And here we see an old view of the push carts on Prince Street near Springfield Avenue. Now, basically, this street was a replica of Orchard Street in Lower East Side. So you have a lot of poor people and you had um, garment factories or sweatshops where they had signs posted that said, if you don't come to work on Saturday, don't bother coming in on Sunday. So people went into businesses for themselves. So they rented push carts and they got some merchandise, some buttons, some fruits and vegetables or used secondhand clothing. And they sold them for six days out of the week from Sunday through Friday. And on Saturday, they closed up shop. Now this picture was taken, I think it was in 1926 and um, they were closed. Now that, picture took place, I think it was Rosh Hashanah Shabbos. So you had a three-day holiday, just like we have this year of Pesach, where we have Friday is Erev Pesach, and then you have two additional days of Yantip. So here we had three days where these people didn't have work. And they also had um, bath, public bathhouses, because in these tenements, uh, they didn't always have built-in bathrooms. They would have a, uh, just a toilet in the, in the hallways shared by other families. So they would have a public bathhouse so they can take their weekly, daily, monthly, or annual bath, depending on how close they wanted to be to their friends or relatives. Uh, Oab Shalom moved to High Street in uh, 19, uh, when was that? 1911, they built this beautiful building, building which is still standing. It's uh, located um, maybe 100, 200 feet south of the old YMHA of Newark. Um, Governor Woodrow Wilson and Rabbi Solomon Schachter, uh, who was the head of the Jewish Theological Seminary, spoke at the dedication ceremony. Uh, the congregation remained at this location until 1957. Uh, it then moved to South Orange. Uh, I want to point out that Newark, um, the Jews did not leave Newark en masse after the riots. Instead, they slowly uh, moved out because the children uh, wanted to get out of the city. Also, people were upward mobile, mobile, if you will, and they wanted to have a better life in the suburbs. So they moved to the Oranges, West Orange, uh, East Orange, um, Short Hills, and Livingston. Um, so Ar Shalom is now located in South Orange. We're looking at the old young Israel of Newark on Wikwik Avenue and Maple. Uh, that building to the left, that tall uh, beige building with the red roof, was the old Newark Beth Israel Hospital. Um, it was designed in 1927 by a Jewish architect, Frank Grad, who also designed the YMHA of Newark, the Mosque Theater, which later became the Newark Symphony Hall, uh, the Art Deco Left Court Newark building, which is a National Historic Landmark. Uh, it's been uh, just restored as a residential apartment house. Uh, and also the Riego Park Jewish Center in Queens, New York. Uh, so Beth Israel Hospital was the first Jewish hospital in Newark. It was created due to the systematic anti-Semitism in American med medicine. Um, they just didn't want Jewish doctors. Uh, it is now part of St. Barnabas healthcare system. Uh, part of the deal with the hospital, with the Barnabas Hospital, was that Beth Israel maintained its name, Beth Israel, or the Beth, as they call it, uh, and also the Star of David logo uh, is still there. But it's owned by St. Barnabas 
um, medical group. Uh, we're looking at the cherry blossoms in um, North Branch Park. It was created, the trees, the cherry trees were brought over uh, by Caroline Bamberger Fold. Uh, she introduced thousands of cherry trees to the park. Um, and the Cherry Blossom Festival is going to start in about a month and a half. Well, depending on the weather conditions, it comes and goes. But it's usually in around mid-April, early May. Um, and it's gorgeous. Uh, actually, so she was the sister of uh, Louis Bamberger. Um, Max, well, Felix Fold, whom she married, was uh, Louis Bamberger's partner. Uh, Branch Brook Park was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., the son of the major uh, landscape architect who designed Central Park in Manhattan and Prospect Park in Brooklyn. Moving right along to Week Week, we can't say anything about Newark without Week Week High School. Yay, Week Week. Um, which is located at 279 Chancellor Avenue, was built in 1935 in the Art Deco style. Uh, the murals, when you come into the front doors, are now in the process of being totally restored. Uh, they were in horrible shape, and, and if you go back, well, if you go back, uh, they should be uh, really uh, eye-catching. I wanna mention briefly some of the children of Newark. Uh, those are people who either lived or born or lived at one time in their lives in the city. Uh, they include Jerry Lewis, Philip Roth, Jerome Kern, Fanny Bryce, Dory Sherry, Edward I. Koch, mayor of New York City, Paula Ben-Gurion, who studied nursing at Beth Israel Medical Center, uh, or the nursing school, and later married David Ben-Gurion, uh, Paul Simon from Simon and Garfunkel, Connie Francis, Allen Ginsberg, and Jason Alexander, who played George in Seinfeld. So there are a lot of nice people who uh, came from the city. Uh, something interesting is going on in Manhattan in 1874. Uh, there was a synagogue called Anshe Chesed located on Lexington Avenue, 63rd Street. Um, they built this ma magnificent synagogue um, in 1874, as I mentioned. The building later became Temple Bethel and then later Rodef Shalom. It was demolished in the 1920s. The Ark was spared and was put in cold storage. Congregation Ava Shalom in 1923, located at 145 Broadway in Newark, heard of this Ark and said, we want it. So the problem was that the Ark is, was about 50 feet in height and the synagogue ceiling was about 25 feet in height. So what they did was they chopped off the top part of the ark. And if you go to this synagogue in Newark, which is still in operation, I think it's the very last one uh, in the city proper, um, you can see this glorious ark. The details are solid oak, uh, gorgeous. Uh, the building is now also a home of the Jewish Museum of New Jersey. Moving out to Jersey City, we're looking at Agudath Shalom, located at 412 Bergen Avenue. It was built in 1914. Uh, it is now a local church, but all of the stars of David are still there. It's just too expensive to remove. Still in Jersey City, we're looking at the old congregation um, Ohab Shalom. I really like the way they wrote, look at the top of the um, the point uh, above the Magen David, you see the how they spell congregat, I-O-N, Geishan. Uh, they didn't have enough space, so they just squished it in. Um, this building again had a fire, a major fire, and they uh, closed it down. It is now demolished. But that you'll notice over the doors, they took the benches, the back seats of the benches with the, uh, where they would put the sidurim. You can see those still there. I'm stuck. Um, I'm, st I'm Why is my thing not moving? Ah. Okay, I'm having a technical difficulty on my computer. It's not advancing. What to do? Anybody? 
Pray. I pray. <laughs> but you, um, Either use down. the cursor or go down and um, and advance the slide from the bottom. Well, that's how I'm doing it now. So they go up onto the slide and try to advance it that way. Pardon? Go up onto the slide and try to advance it that way. Just click on the slide itself. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, we're good. I'm pushing on my mouse now. Okay. I'll, I'll continue that way. Uh, we're now in, still in Jersey City. We're looking at a very interesting building. Uh, it's in the Heights section of Jersey City. Um, there's a, it's a very beautiful residential area. Mount Sonic Congregation uh, was built around 1925. And the local people say there's nobody left, but they do have a website and they did have perm services. So it's questionable whether they're, they're there or not there, but it's just a beautiful building. And uh, I just hope they're, they're still hanging in there. Um, also the difference between this area of Jersey City known as the Heights and Hoboken is about 100 steps. And you can go down from that area down to Hoboken. Uh, we're now still in Jersey City. I want to point out three different congregation or synagogue buildings. And we're just going to look at the architecture very briefly. We're going to see a set of stairs leading up to the three doors, the three main entrances. Um, and then you have a, uh, an arch with three wheels and a mug and it above that and two other vertical uh, stained glass windows on either side of the central arch. Uh, those are the staircases leading up to the women's gallery. So this is the, um, hold on one second. This was Sons of Israel of Jersey City located right near City Hall at 294 Grove Street, it was built in 1920. The building is now a mosque. Oh, let me do it this way. Uh, we're now in Long Branch and we're looking at the old Brothers of Israel congregation, also built in the 1920s. And notice the st stairs going up to the three doors the arch, the three wheels, and the staircases up to the women's gallery. This building is now demolished. One additional building was in New Brunswick, and we're looking at Poale Tzedek, which became a national historic landmark. I love that federal style uh, wood frame building to the right. Um, but you'll also notice the staircase, the three doors, the arch, and the three wheels, and the, the women's gallery staircases on either side. Uh, there was a major electrical fire in this congregation in 2015. The congregation wanted to rebuild, and then they said they gave up until they saw that no money was coming in, so it is now demolished. Well, this is the interior of, the, of that building of the last Powell. I'd said a gorgeous, gorgeous building. And for the last few years before they had the fire, they uh, just used the upstairs for Rosh Hashanah uh, and Yom Kippur services. Glorious building. What's the significance? We're now in Hoboken and we're looking at the United Synagogue, Kochav Yisrael, a conservative congregation. Uh, Hoboken is at sea level. So when they had Hurricane Sandy, this synagogue was inundated with water. But they're still around. They did rebuild and um, dried out. And they're still functioning. Beautiful building. Um, that building actually was designed. It was modeled after the, uh, in Frankfurt am Main, Germany, uh, the Neue Synagogue, uh, which was from the 1850s. Uh, you'll notice there are um, onion domes on top, similar to the uh, onion domes in Hoboken. So this was the basis, uh, the prototype for that old building. We're leaving Hoboken and going to Trenton. We're looking at the old, the, an aerial view of Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, Jews, again, we had the basic concept of the German Jews coming in the 1840s and 50s. Then you had the Polish Eastern European Jews coming in the 1880s after the pogroms in Eastern Europe. And uh, everybody moved out and, uh, and they're scattered. So we're going to see some of the old, uh, here's a view of East State Street around 1900. I love that dress all the way down to the floor. Very tzniastic, as they say in Yiddish. Uh, the Public Library of Trenton was organized in 1750. It goes back. Uh, and some of the major dry goods stores, the department stores included Robinson's and Goldberg's of Trenton, New Jersey. 
And here we see just a view of people going out for a Sunday ride in the 1920s, a general view, and a girl bringing bottles, empty bottles, milk bottles back to the store for a penny, recycling. I love that wagon it's in. And they had clover bloom butter by Armour. And here's Levine's Groceries holding Freyhofer's Sonny's Boy Enriched White Bread. And you'll notice on the background, Giello Tapioca Pudding and Tetley Teas and Welch's Grape Juice and Budget Beans and Pork. Ah. <laughs> uh, there were major synagogues, including Sinai Temple in Trenton and also Adat Israel on Bellevue Avenue. Um, but one of the smaller synagogues located not far from the, uh, the Trenton Public Library was called Anshe Fife. Now, what does that mean? Well, they spoke Yiddish in those days. So they had one person joining and two persons joining and three persons joining. Four, and they had five persons joining. So those were the five members, Anshe Fife of Trenton, New Jersey. Five. Uh, an aerial view of Patterson, New Jersey. And we're looking at the waterfalls, which is a national historic park nowadays, and some of the old silk factories, uh, many of which were built by Jewish um, um, merchants. In power, now historic landmark, the buildings are, are like frozen in time. And we're gonna talk now a little bit about Nathan Bonnert, who was the first Jewish mayor of Patterson. He was born in Germany in 1838. He went to uh, California to, for the gold rush in 1849. Uh, he returned to the Lower East Side in 1858 and then moved to Patterson and built many of the silk factories. He donated over $1 million to Jewish causes. Uh, he built the Barnard Memorial Hospital. He founded the Barnard Memorial Temple, which we're gonna see in a moment, B'nai Jeshurun, which is the oldest synagogue in all of New Jersey, built in, uh, or founded 1847. And he had a statue of himself built while he was still alive and it's located in front of City Hall. A very humble person. Uh, here we see a view, the upper picture is the Bonnet Memorial Hospital of Patterson, the Bonnet Memorial Temple, which is no longer standing at this location. Uh, they rebuilt on the same site in 1961. Um, and that building is now a local mosque. And here we see the interior of the Bonnet Memorial Temple um, in downtown Patterson. Um, there's a story uh, that President McKinley was a friend of Nathan Bonnert. Uh, he was invited by uh, Bonnert to attend a Friday evening service in 1900. They walked arm in arm down the aisle to Lachadodi. Um, I don't know if they danced it, but they walked. Um, uh, ultimately, on September 6, 1901, President McKinley was assassinated. He was shot in Buffalo, New York. Another major um, member of the um, Patterson Jewish community was a Mr. Jack Fabian, who was a movie chain mogul uh, connected with Warner Brothers in Hollywood. Uh, he built over 247 Stanley slash Fabian movie theaters throughout the Northeast of the United States. Um, Fred Wentworth um, was his architect and uh, he designed most of the movie theaters. He also designed Temple Emanuel of Patterson, which we're gonna see right here. Uh, he also designed the YMHA of Patterson and the Barnard Memorial Hospital. Uh, we're gonna be looking at one of the only Art Deco synagogues in the United States. It's an octagonal shape, it's eight-sided, and it's glorious. Here we see an exterior view. It was basically named after um, Abraham, um, um, what's his name, Fabian, who was um, Jack Fabian's son was killed, I think during World War I. This building was built in 1929, just before the Great Depression. And here we're going to see some of the interior slides of the uh, stained glass windows in the Art Deco format, and also the skylight, which kind of is 
dazzling. If you start looking at it closely, it starts to vibrate. Very beautiful. Now, I went back to Temple Emanuel of Patterson uh, several years ago. There were plans on taking out all those stained glass windows and the arc was they moved out to Franklin Lakes as also uh, Temple uh, B'nai Jeshurun moved out to the same neighborhood in Franklin Lakes. Um, however, Temple Emanuel never relocated or never removed any of the stained glass windows and the skylight was still there when I went back and all of the stained glass windows were gone. Very sad. Uh, our next um, town or section is devoted to the Jersey Homesteads. Now, this is a moving truck from Brownsville, Brooklyn, from Blake Avenue, uh, bringing people out to the Jersey Homesteads. Um, what was the Jersey Homesteads? Okay. It was designed as a cooperative agricultural industrial community for 200 unemployed Jewish garment workers from Philadelphia and New York City. There was a lottery for these people. So it's a very limited, although there are many people involved, but it was only limited to Jewish unemployed garment workers uh, from Philly and New York. Um, Alfred Kastner designed each house in a relatively identical style. We're gonna see pictures of this in a moment. Um, and he designed them as one levels with a carport, a flat roof, poured concrete. Um, and they had one to three bedrooms. Um, let's continue. We're looking at the mural, which was designed by artist Ben Sean, who lived in, this was in 1935 in the middle of the Great Depression. And Ben Sean was a WPA artist um, commissioned to design. This is located in the local library. On the lower left-hand bottom, we see the stalls, if you will, of Ellis Island, where immigrants were processed up until 1924. In the center, dead center, you see this man with this mop head. That's Albert Einstein, who was brought over uh, actually, he was he was brought over by Louis Bamberger, who was his friend, and he was uh, brought out of Nazi Germany in the early 1930s. Uh, he lived in Roosevelt, New Jersey, before he moved down to Princeton. And on the right-hand corner, right-hand section, we see uh, Garmin workers sitting at the sewing machines. And the next view is... Um, Elements going on in the center, we see the blueprint of the Jersey homesteads uh, located near Heightstown. In the center, you would have the housing complex. You would have uh, on the above that um, center portion, you see a picture of uh, FDR, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. To the right of the president, we see the co-op. So the concept of Roosevelt was of, of uh, Jersey homestead was to have it as a cooperative, almost like a kibbutz where all the money's earned would go back into, uh, into the company, if you will. And then we see on the middle section on top, you see homes with pitched roofs. Now that's an, an, an inaccuracy because we're gonna see now what really happened. This is what the homes look like. They were flat roof, concrete, four inches thick. They used cinder blocks and smeared with uh, stucco. And all of the houses had a carport. So, so they were planning, these were unemployed garment workers, Jewish unemployed garment workers. Um, they had plans on becoming wealthy. And I went to, to Roosevelt and I was expecting um, something more. Actually, if you drive more than 15 miles an hour, you're gonna pass the whole town. It's like, it's like here, it's there, it's gone. Um, but you have to turn off the main road and then you see these houses but all the houses look the same but when i went there <coughs> excuse me i spoke to a mr goldberg and he said oh yeah so we saw this picture and he says that's mrs mr shapiro's house and down the road there that's mr fine's house so they all look the same to me but to them they knew exactly where everybody lived and here we see some of the garment workers and here's one more making clothing and they also have the congregation Anshe Roosevelt. So Roosevelt, or rather Jersey Homesteads, as a, a self-contained agri cooperative agricultural industrial community, 
it failed as as a cooperative. So, but it did survive. Uh, it opened up after like two or three years after they opened in 1935 or so. Um, they opened it up to the general public and many artists moved in. So it was almost like an artist colony. So it was very interesting. That's how Ben Sean and Albert Einstein uh, lived in this area. So this was the synagogue. And up until recently, they only used it for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Uh, there was a big scandal going on recently. Uh, a yeshiva moved in. And they said we're going to revive the community. We're going to, and but the locals didn't want it. And and it was just, you have to read up on that. And it's a very sad story. And, and ultimately, the yeshiva moved out, and, but the shul is still standing. Uh, our next section is the Jewish farmers. Uh, anyway, Jersey Homestead uh, became Roosevelt, New Jersey, after Franklin Delano Roosevelt passed away. Uh, and there was a debate about that as well. But our next section deals with the, the Yiddish farmer, the Jewish farmer. Uh, there was a plan by um, Baron Maurice de Hirsch to bring, hold on one second, people from the pogroms, Eastern European people who were being killed left and right just because they were Jewish, take them out of Eastern Europe and bring them out to, um, not so much to the Lower East Side or to the, the major urban centers, but bring them, take them out of these areas from, from Boston and Baltimore and Chicago and Philadelphia and bring them out to the countryside. And the nearest countryside from the Lower East Side would be Jersey, New Jersey. And um, that was the intent of so some of the first Jewish agricultural settlements uh, included Alliance and Woodbine. Uh, this was in the 1880s. This map of America, interesting, for those who can read it, is in Yiddish. Now, people coming from the shtetls, from the little villages of Poland and Eastern Europe, only spoke Yiddish for the most part. And they had Yiddish newspapers, the forwards, the Algemeine, the Morgan Journal, to name just a few. And they had the, the Yiddish Reformer that we saw a minute ago was a publication put up by the Jewish Agricultural Society of America, which I think is still in existence, I don't know how, but they printed everything in Yiddish. So now if you look up on the upper left-hand corner, you have a state called Washington to us American people, but in Yiddish, it's Washington. And there's a place called Walla Walla, Washington. But if you look at the bottom of the Washington state, it says Walla Walla, Washington. Love this map, great stuff. And then you see all the other, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, California. Uh, this other map was drawn up by uh, Mr. Alan Myers, who did spend most of his life doing research on Jewish farmers of New Jersey. Uh, he lives in Philadelphia or near Philadelphia. Uh, and he uh, wrote several books about uh, Jewish farmers. And he drew this up this map showing the train tracks connecting all of these little towns near Vineland. And so you had a town called Alliance. You had a town, it's near Bridgeton. It's near Chevron, Mitzpah. You had, it's not, it's 20, it's 30 miles south um, west of Atlantic City. It's near Millville. There's something called uh, Center Grove, Carmel, Rosenheim, Brotmanville. These are just the, a few of the names. And on the bottom of this map, you see something called Woodbine. We're going to spend a, a bunch of time over uh, in that town. Uh, here we see uh, a plaque which says, in memory of the first colonists who migrated from Russia to the woodlands of South, South Jersey, and on May 9th, 1882, founded Alliance, the first Jewish farm colony in the United States. And when you go to this area today, you see an impeccably kept Jewish cemetery, not a spot on uh, the grass is cut. Every gravestone is immaculate. It's like, it, it's, it's gorgeous. And in this area, you have little synagogues, wood frame synagogues dotting the, the landscape. So we see here Garden Road Synagogue in the middle of a cornfield. This is about five miles west of Vineland. And it's still there. It's still in use once a year. 
And you'll notice there's an upstairs, there's an entranceway downstairs and the two, two windows up. That's the women's balcony. This was designed as an orthodox congregation. They would walk from their farmhouses through the fields and come to this little synagogue. And they would come every Saturday, every Shabbos. And they would do their, their, their gardening, their, their, their uh, farming. And here we come to Woodbine, America. Interesting neighborhood, Woodbine. It was the first all Jewish incorporated town in the world. It was organized in 1890 or thereabouts, but it became incorporated in 1903 as an official incorporated town. Tel Aviv was not incorporated until 1909. So this predates uh, Tel Aviv uh, as an incorporated town. Um, what happened was here that everybody who ran the government of Woodbine spoke Yiddish and they were all Jewish. Well comes comes with the with the territory all the civil servants in town including the mayor police chief fire chief town council were all jewish and they all spoke conducted business in yiddish um now they may have been starting as a agricultural community but many times um the crops failed so they had a backup plan. So they built factories, clothing factories. And here we see Snellenberg's factory. They had a major department store on Market Street in Philadelphia. So you had the, the train lines, the railroads connected. Philadelphia, which was maybe a 20 minute ride away and New York, which was maybe an hour away. So you had the links to the markets in New York and Philadelphia. So this was in the center of all of this. So they would have their backup plan and they would have their clothing factories so the people who could work and thrive uh, as a Jewish community. And he would see some of the children in the fields lined up. Uh, I think one of the guys looks like Spanky and that's Miss McGillicuddy in the background, from our gang. And he would see a pot belly stove in one of the classrooms. They didn't have electricity until 1916. So they were living kind of in primitive conditions. And here we see the Woodbine Brotherhood Synagogue, the school children of that congregation. There are over 200 in this photograph. I don't know if anybody recognizes anybody. Um, now I had this expectation when I went to Woodbine about 10 years, maybe 15 years ago, I was expecting a shtetl because all the books I read about would be, oh, everybody's Yiddish, they speak with, it. everybody's Jewish, they talk in Yiddish and, and this and that. And there's even a story of uh, a basketball team. Uh, they were playing another uh, a local team nearby, like let's say um, Carmel uh, in New Jersey. And since the, they only spoke Yiddish, there's a basketball players were, were signaling in Yiddish. So the other team said, said Gunish Helfen, which means it won't help because we understand what you're saying. Moving right along. And that's the building. Now, this is the west side, the main entrance of the Woodbine Brotherhood Synagogue, built in 1891. This is the western wall. The opposite side of this building is the eastern wall. So it's true to the halakha with the Eastern Wall, and this is what the building looks like. So I was expecting to find everybody speaking Yiddish and, and almost like Lakewood or like Williamsburg or something to that sort. And when I came there, you couldn't see, uh, everybody spoke Spanish. It's a Mexican town. It's very, there may be one or two surviving elderly people in the town. It's very sad, but, it, but it's history. It's living history. And here's the interior. What's interesting about this synagogue, which is now the um, the Woodbine, um, it's a national historic landmark. It's also the museum of um, of Woodbine heritage, which um, was I think they closed it down because of the pandemic. Um, the website is is missing. It's not no longer there. I'm, I'm re really sad about this. And they restored it. They spent over a million dollars to restore the whole building. And up until about a year ago, they would have Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur services, and they would leave the white curtains because you usually change the curtains from the usually the blue or the 
or the or the uh, maroon color uh, art covers and uh, the uh, the bima covers. So they changed it all to white for Rosh Hashanah. So every year they didn't have to change because it's always they only come for Rosh Hashanah. So it's, it was always there. But it's sad that the building is closed. But hopefully it'll change. Uh, and here we see, look on top, you see Chevra Gudas Achim de Vudbein. And this is the memorial plaque. Uh, let's see, the third one down, it says Mali Alperin Bas Ariyalev, 1937. Third one down on the right. Interesting. The Woodbine, Woodbine Volunteer Fire Department. Great shot. The chief rabbi of the town was also the fire chief. He just changed his hat. Change the hat and then, you know, one day you're a rabbi, one day you're a fireman. Uh, we're moving now along <laughs> to the resort communities of Lakewood. We start with Lakewood. This is a Victorian beautiful picture of Lakewood in the early days. And they had grand hotels in Lakewood and also had very wealthy people living there, including, hold on one second. Do -do 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 -do. Yes, George J. Gould had a little house in Lakewood called the Georgian Court. He was a robber baron. Uh, it's now part of the Georgian Court College. And it's just one block away from the uh, big yeshiva there, the base of Medrash uh, Hagadol. And the rabbi there was Rev. Aaron Cutler, if anyone's familiar. But you'll notice here the Palace of Versailles almost in Lakewood. Now, this is still there as part of the college campus. Uh, also, John D. Rockefeller Sr. had a little house in Lakewood. Now we're coming to interesting stuff. This is the main entrance to the Laurel and the Pines Hotel in Lakewood, a five-star hotel, grand hotel. Can't beat it. Now, together with his brothers, Isidore and Oscar and Nathan Strauss built Macy's department store from a crockery shop uh, on Chamber Street in Lower Manhattan into the mega store on Broadway and 34th Street. Nathan Strauss made a reservation at the Laurel and the Pines Hotel in Lakewood in 1900 for over 100 people with his, that was his entourage, that was his family and all of the butlers and maids came along. Now, when they got there, he had, he, he had a confirmed reservation when he got there, the clerk at the front desk said, oh, yes, we have your reservation, but there's a slight problem. We don't accept Hebrews. Oi, that's a big problem. So Nathan Strauss, in a huff, said, I'll show you guys. So ultimately, he bought about 20 acres of property across the street from this hotel, and he built the Lakewood Hotel another five-star hotel, which allowed all Jews and all Christians and all denominations into the hotel. Now, if you've been to Lakewood in the recent years, none of these hotels, I think it's just the best Western, I think that's all that's left of these grand hotels. Uh, but that's kind of a sad history. Also, Isidore Strauss, uh, one of the Strauss brothers, uh, did go down and sink in the Titanic in 1912 with his wife. Oops, well, we, we skipped one. Let me go back one. Yeah. Uh, in Lakewood, we have this uh, Orthodox Congregation Sons of Israel, uh, which was modeled after a shtetl synagogue from Poland, one of those wood frame buildings. It was designed by the firm of Davis, Brody, and Wisniewski in 1963. Why do I mention that? Because Chet Wisniewski was my teacher at Cooper Union in uh, architecture school. And he always came in with hot shorts and was always drunk. Great guy. Uh, <laughs> here we see the Holocaust Memorial in front of the synagogue. And there's a great sign in front of the synagogue as well. I think they moved it. The 11th commandment, thou shalt not park here on the Sabbath. Cool stuff. We're now finishing up our tour. We're going down to the Jersey Shore. And we're going to fly in our, gosh, it looks like an Orville Wright brother plane. And it says, I'm not kidding when I say Atlantic City, New Jersey, sure looks like, look, sure looks mighty good to me. And you'll notice there are no synagogues, just a lot of church steeples. That's okay. 
And here's a, an early view from 1900 on the beach in Atlantic City. Uh, cool shot. And they built several of the major synagogues, including um, Kehillat Israel. No, this was the uh, Beth Israel Congregation, organized in 1890, built in 1913. It was located at 906 Pacific Avenue. It is now demolished, but you can see where it's located. You can see the resorts casino in the distance. And another major synagogue was the Beth Kehillah, also known as the Community Synagogue. You know, you'll notice that tall apartment house uh, just behind the synagogue. That was, this was located on Pacific and Maryland Avenues, uh, built in 1922. The, uh, that tall building housed the Community Haven Seniors Apartment, uh, located at 35 South Virginia Avenue. That was basically, was located right near the synagogue. So the seniors, mostly Jewish, could attend services if they chose to go and just go downstairs and they were right there. So the synagogue is now demolished and the apartment house is still standing. And then we're moving down to Margate and we're looking at the Elephant Hotel. That's that little building on the right and the elephant is still standing. She's known as Lucy the Elephant. Uh, it was built for real estate purposes so people could climb up on top and look down at the new community being built so they can buy housing there. And here we see we have last few slides show the Daniel Guggenheim uh, bungalow, if you will, uh, in Long Branch called the Firenze, also known as Florence, I guess, Florence, Italy, and also the Shadow Lane House uh, for, well, it was originally built for the president of the Woolworth Company. Um, this is in Long Branch, known as Shadow Lawn. It's the, the mansion later served as the summer White House for President Woodrow Wilson. We mentioned Woodrow Wilson when he was a governor way back on High Street when he uh, uh, dedicated the synagogue. This is now part of Monmouth College. Uh, there's one more slide here. And basically, this is the Deal Synagogue. Deal is a, a community um, composed primarily of Sephardic or Syrian Jews who live in Brooklyn for most of the year. But for three months, they come down to the shore and spend the time this summer in Deal. So that's the program. I hope you enjoyed it. Are there like 100 people? Do you, are you there? Is anybody there? <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. What's the thank you very much of the three wheels uh, that we saw? What is the reasoning? There's no reason. It's just an architectural statement. Oh, okay. That's uh, I just, you know, I was noticing it. Like, I said, why? Why is that? I, and, but, but it's consistent. So it wasn't the same architect. It was a variation on the main theme. I, I have a question for you. Yes. What, did you have any pictures of Passaic? I have picked, not in this program, no. Mm -hmm. Actually, there used to be one synagogue with the three wheels in Passaic as well. Do you remember that one? I remember it. Mm -hmm. And there was one, I think it was Teferit Israel. It was That's a pink was brick building in the, in the old section of town. <laughs> and they took the ark and the Bema, and they brought it out to, I think it's Raleigh, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I'm familiar with that. I was, I was more mitzvah than that one on Ferris Israel and Madison Avenue. Yeah, yeah. As a uh, sidelight uh, to, the, to, the, to the Baron de Hirsch that, that you were mentioning with Woodbine, right. my father's parents left Russia in 1902, okay. thanks to the Baron de Hirsch people, okay. and they went to Even Argentina. Went to right, they had another where, series of communities right. down there, colonies, yes. Correct, where they sent my, my grandparents down to be farmers, and they were never farmers in Russia, but when they got to Wherever it was, I guess on the outskirts of when they had Mo Moisesville, <laughs> they quickly learned how to to become a farmer, 
and they got to be friends with the Chaco Indians who were living in the forest there. I didn't know. I was very interesting because if you go into the history of of uh, of Baron de Hirsch, a very very philanthropic yeah, person. Uh, he did incredible things for the European and the Russian Jews, bringing them from there here to the United States. Oh, no. He also brought them out to the Dakotas. Uh, there were Jewish farm colonies and also in um, uh, it was Saskatchewan, uh, Canada. <laughs> so he, he did wonderful work, yes. Any more comments or questions? Excuse us for one second, please. Yes. Yeah, this is David Greenberg, you know, the yes. press, you know, one of the co-presidents. And this has been a great, this has been really a great event. Okay, so I do want to thank Arlene and, for, Mindy. and Mindy for setting this up. This is whole social committee, you know, so we really appreciate this. What I would like to also say is our Zoom, our Zoom license is a hundred members and we exceeded that today. Wow. So this was actually extraordinary. Um, so one of the things that we'd like to do is continue programming like this. And so we really do need, right. you know, emails to, you know, so we could reach out to everybody. If you could, if you could send either contact the office or include your email in the chat, that would be really helpful. And you know, again, to, in, to do these programs in the future, any donations would be greatly appreciated. You know, thank you so much. It said at the beginning. Thank you for having me. And thank it was you. Yes, yeah, it was great. After. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you, Oscar. Hebrew Free School, then it was Community Center. I'll take a bow. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll wave. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other programs? Uh, I'm working uh, this week. I'm, I was contacted by the Newark Public Library. Uh, we're going to be doing a, a uh, Zoom uh, just about Newark. Mm -hmm. Gen generic. Get so that? it's not going to be a Jewish thing. It's going to be like all of Newark. So it's going to be um, all the different neighborhoods and uh, the Morris Canal and the subways and North Brook Branch. I mean, North Branch, whatever it's called, <laughs> the park. Uh, we we can park, high school, uh, a lot of stuff. Yeah. Even though Oscar, when did you say that program was? That's going to be called Welcome Back to Newark. Uh, and it's when? Uh, we don't have it scheduled yet, but we're going to work on it this week. Okay. I'm asking because I'm, I'm a less famous graduate of Week Wake High School. There you go. Uh, and of uh, Young Israel of Newark. There you go. <laughs> that was oh, yeah. Rabbi uh, Siegel. Zeb Siegel, yeah. yeah. My father taught there for many years. Yeah. Who was have your you father? Done have you done any uh, research on um, Mount Freedom and any of the areas like that where Jews uh, were coming out there in the 30s and 40s? Those would be the egg farmers, chicken farmers. I used to have a, a chicken farmer. I used to live in Borough Park, Brooklyn, and my parents spoke Yiddish as the, their major language. And this farmer, Mr. Rothkop, from I think Tom's River slash Lakewood would come every Tuesday morning. He would be at our house at 8 a.m. So he probably left around six o'clock to get all the, the, the fresh eggs, the fresh milk, the fresh butter, the fresh mm. cheese. And, he, and then he would schmooze for an hour or two in Yiddish. <laughs> and they would have a whole schmoo, a whole conversation for, for hours. <laughs> It was, it was wonderful. Put Judy Siegel, <laughs> Stephanie Levine said he should get rid of the picture so we could see everybody. No, oh, there we go. No. Just move it over. In parentheses. Okay, any more questions or comments or <laughs> otherwise? No. Uh, can you uh, give us uh, your web things? A web address? Uh, the so website we can... is israelowitzpublishing.com. <laughs> I-S-R-A-E-L-O-W-I-T-Z publishing.com. And then I have books and lectures and tours and, and whatnots.
with Adrian. My wife and I were married at Community <laughs> Synagogue in Patterson. Okay. Do you know if that shul is still around? Um, I kind of doubt it. Um, there is a small, there's a yeshiva there actually uh, in Patterson. I don't know how well they're doing these days, but they, they moved into the old section of town in the old mansions and they renovated it and turned it into like the, the yeshiva. And, um, but in terms of functioning synagogues, I'm not aware of any. Everybody moved down to Clifton Passaic from Patterson or out to um, Franklin Lakes. Or out to Wayne. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you for thank you for coming. Yes, thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Come again <laughs> real soon. Thank you, thank you. Thank Okay, you. take care. The Daraba, okay, everyone be well. Happy Bosh Chodesh. Yes, Chodesh yeah. Tov to everyone. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Thanks to our uh, social committee again. Um, I'm going to end the program. So uh, everybody be well. It was just so wonderful to have everyone here and really for such a great program. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.